Uh, I appreciate uh, the attention that you uh, will give to this presentation and uh, learning about uh, uh, hip and knee treatments. Uh, most of you are probably here because of uh, your ailments uh, with the hip and knee. So um, hopefully you find this very uh, informative and uh, know that you have many options to treat your pain. And uh, uh, if it's something that needs to be surgically operated on, this will be something that you could uh, find helpful and understanding of what your future uh, may hold. So uh, without further ado, I will go into the presentation. Um, I do not have any royalties uh, with any of the companies or um, uh, technology that is presented. Uh, so who am I? So I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and I'm the oldest of uh, two uh, brothers. So both of my brothers are uh, physician assistants uh, um, in uh, Texas and Missouri. Uh, we are the first generation to go to college. Um, I'm the third in the family to go to college as well. Um, and my family comes from the Netherlands, so that's uh, basically how we got here in the first place. Uh, why we moved to Colorado is basically my wife, um, and I put this in quotations because uh, we're getting married in uh, about a week. Uh, but if you look at this picture of uh, Kelsey and I on the side, uh, we actually got married together exactly one year ago on top of Independence Pass uh, together uh, with my dog Gunner as our witness. Uh, so, and of course, moving to Colorado, um, uh, we love the outdoors and um, hiking and all the other things that beautiful Colorado has to offer. Uh, only have dogs so far and no kiddos, so here is a picture of the two um, down below. Uh, the first one is Gunner. Uh, he's my, or he was my alpha dog. Unfortunately, he passed away just a few months ago to heart cancer, but he was my first dog and my best man, um, and he was quite the adventurer. Uh, Knox is our newest one. He's such a goober, uh, as you can see down below. He was named after Knoxville, Tennessee, which is uh, where I went to school. Uh, so, um, like uh, Karen said, I am a, a hip and knee replacement specialist, uh, specializing in many complex uh, problems with hip and knees. Uh, like I said before, I went to the University of Tennessee for both medical school and undergrad. Um, I did my hip and knee replacement fellowship in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, where Dr. Arthur Malcani, who is uh, one of the most renowned surgeons um, in the United States, um, trained me. And he's actually one of the designers of many of the Stryker products and one of the highest consulted uh, surgeons uh, for the Mako. Uh, during my training, I did about 500 or more cases with the Mako in, in addition to uh, complex hip and knee revisions. Uh, I did my residency in Omaha, Nebraska, um, which is where I met my wife. Uh, and uh, I was trained by Dr. Kevin Garvin, who um, is the president or was the president of the Hip Society. Uh, a little interesting tidbit of why I went into uh, hip and knee replacements is the extensive training that I received in Nebraska. So usually um, residents only get about 20 weeks worth of uh, joint reconstruction training, whereas I had almost two or one, in year, one, and a half, one and a half years of training just in hip and knee replacements. So a little bit about my practice. Um, I do about 80% total joints uh, currently, uh, peppered in with some lower extremity trauma because I find that very interesting and it helps me be a more well-rounded surgeon. Uh, currently about 25% of my uh, practice is also revisions, that is redo surgeries. Uh, here's a couple of uh, recent cases as you can see um, in these pictures that these are much more complex, a lot more metal, a lot worse problems for these patients and so a lot of other physicians around the region will send me complex problems or when things do not go well to me to uh, take care of. Uh, currently about 10% of the primary uncomplicated total joints that I do go home on the same day of surgery. Uh, my offices are in Boulder, Lafayette, and Yuma. Um, so uh, those are the three main locations that I uh, see patients at. Um, here in Boulder, as a practice as a whole, Boulder Center for Orthopedics and Spine, we have the lowest complication rate really in the region, but mostly uh, in Boulder County. Um, so let's talk about what knee pain and hip pain is. So knee pain is the third most common reason for visiting the doctor for pain, number one being back pain, 
the other one being chronic headaches or acute headaches. Um, so knee pain is extremely common, and probably at one point in your life, you or somebody that you know has had knee pain. Now, what we like to think about is acute versus chronic pain. So acute pain usually presents uh, within the first six weeks. Sometimes patients don't really know what happened, but their knee started hurting. Uh, typically, these are meniscus tears, uh, which is the most common knee injury. Uh, other things could be ligament injuries, such as ACLs and MCLs, tendon injuries, patellar tendonitis, quadriceps tendonitis. And then every once in a while, patients may fall, they don't break anything, but they have a significant bone bruise. Uh, chronically, would be greater than six weeks. So this is how we kind of think about your pain and what is most likely causing it. Uh, meniscus tear is one of them. Again, most patients don't even realize that they injured their meniscus. Uh, arthritis, which is kind of the bulk of the lecture today, is also an extremely common. And then finally, chronic tendonitis. Hip pain, we like to think more in the location. So uh, there's se diff several different places where patients may think, oh, this is where it hurts, this is my hip, but that may actually not be what an orthopedic surgeon considers the hip. So as you can see here in this silhouette, we have the bone outline with the silhouette of uh, the skin on the outside. So if we think about the lateral side or the side of the hip, that's what most patients think is actually the hip. But instead, the hip is actually, or the hip joint is actually in the groin, as you can see in this picture. The side of the hip is close to the skin right in this area, but the joint is further inside. Now, lateral um, pain is usually from one of the tendons or a bursal sac. So the bursa um, is on the side, and it can be inflamed, and it can be quite excruciating. Uh, it can be quite debilitating where you don't want to walk, or you can't sleep at night from laying on the side. Um, in the buttocks is another very common place where patients may have pain and present to our clinics. Uh, most of the time when the pain is deep inside the buttocks, uh, it's usually a nerve. So this could be the sciatic nerve, as you see in this picture down below, the nerve coming out between these two muscles. Um, it could be a pinched nerve further up into the back, or it could be stenosis where the lumbar spine is being compressed. Uh, secondly, higher up into the back and more towards the middle of the back is the SI joint, another very debilitating pain that can get acutely inflamed. So the SI joint is intimately connected to the hip joint as well as to the spine. So if there is arthritis in either one of those joints, this may become inflamed. So this becomes what we call the hip spine syndrome where both the back and the hip affect each other and can actually uh, act in synergy to cause even more pain and debilitation. Finally, the groin. The groin is where the actual hip joint is. So a lot of patients will complain about pain that is in the groin, and it may even radiate down to the knee. In fact, about 20% of patients may present to the clinic complaining of knee pain when in actuality it's their hip that is causing pain. And that's because of the way that the hip is wired. There's a nerve that goes to the hip joint and then radiates down to the middle of the knee. So this could be presented as even thigh pain. Other things that could be um, wrong with the joint is a labrum tear, which is basically like a gasket. So it kind of keeps a suction seal of the hip. Uh, we usually see labrum tears in younger active patients, and they may have other morphological or architectural problems with their hip that may predispose them to labrum tears. Finally, hip flexor to pain. So a lot of patients mistakenly think that they have a flick, uh, hip flexor tendonitis, when in actuality it's pretty rare uh, that that's actually the thing that is wrong. It's usually something along the lines of arthritis or labrum. So uh, that's a very common uh, or very uncommon problem is to have a tendonitis there. So here's an example of what an x-ray of some normal looking hips would be, uh, where you can see that the hip joint is actually towards the groin right here. Now, what is arthritis? So arthritis is basically when the cartilage is worn away. Here on the left side, we have a normal knee uh, in which we have preserved joint cartilage. Now, if we look at the picture on the right, we can see the red areas, which represents basically when the cartilage starts to thin out. 
Now, there's other types of uh, arthritis. Uh, osteoarthritis is the one that's most common where you have the cartilage that wears out over time, but there's other kinds. Uh, systemic processes such as rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or even lupus may cause this. Uh, so these are other inflammatory arthritis that have completely different treatments. So here are some examples of the spectrum of arthritis that you may uh, have or what we may see in the future. So basically what we have right here is two knees. Now when we look at x-rays with two uh, joints on there, uh, it's actually flip-flopped. It's like the patient is staring back at us. So if you look up into the right side of the screen, you see an L. So really on the right side, that's the left knee, and then on the left side, that is the right knee. Now if you want to look at the knees, you can see that the inside portion of the knees have a much more narrow uh, space between it as opposed to the outside joint. That's how we can radiographically diagnose arthritis. This is a very mild form. And so there's a huge spectrum of arthritis that may occur within the hip and knee, such as one of my patients right here. So this is an extreme example of some arthritis in which this uh, fellow's knee is basically falling off, as you can see. So the femur is uh, falling off the tibia, and which makes it much more complex. But the great thing is, is that we live in 2021, we have some phenomenal um, solutions to treat this. Uh, here's another example of an unfortunate patient who uh, was uh, hit by a bus uh, and uh, shattered his knee. Uh, another surgeon uh, did a great job of trying to put everything back together, but unfortunately, as you can see, uh, he does not have any joint sp space left. So this is a more complex knee for our reconstruction. But again, with newer technology, newer techniques, this patient is able to walk again and get back on, uh, back on with his life, go back on hikes, and is even back to work now. Uh, here's an example of hip arthritis. Again, a huge spectrum of different types of arthritis. So now that you are educated on what arthritis looks like, it's pretty obvious that the right side, that is on the left side of the screen, the hip is arthritic. As you can see right here, there's no joint space between, whereas on the other side, there is a nice about, um, amount of space right there. Now, again, huge spectrum. This is a patient with uh, end-stage congenital dysplasia of the hip, in which you can see that the left side of the hip looks pretty bad. So uh, we see all kinds of different things. Uh, now, hip and knee replacements are becoming more common, and there's a multiple reasons why this is occurring. Over the past 15 years, there's been an exponential increase in total hip and knee replacements. And this projection is going to increase as the baby boomers and Generation X get older. However, the uh, indications are expanding. We're doing hip and knee replacements in younger patients uh, because they are more active and the technology has changed. Uh, and then also, people are getting older and they're staying active. So. It, just because you're 85 years old does not mean that you are not a candidate for hip and knee replacements. Now, joint replacement traditionally, back in the, especially the 90s where it was really taking off, uh, there was a lot of issues. Um, and these were really designed for the older, elder patients that were not very active. Um, they were the sedentary patients that went off to play bingo. Well, that's not the way people in Colorado live. Um, in fact, a lot of times, doctors would not even offer the surgery unless you were over the age of 65. Uh, and the reason why is that the technology was just not there. They, the, play, uh, the parts wore out over time and can cause catastrophic problems. So here's a patient down below on the left side of your screen in which uh, you can see on their left knee uh, that the piece of plastic, which is in between these two metal pieces, you can see on the outside portion that that piece of plastic's still there, but there's not much left. Um, that has worn out over time. This patient had this in for 18 years. As you can see on the contralateral side, I had to revise her joint because that plastic particles were chewing away her bones. So I had to replace that, and I'm shortly after going to be replacing the other one. Now, here's a much more dramatic example of another hip, as you can see, where the ball is not even in the socket anymore. The socket is completely torn upside down. So this is an example of a very catastrophic problem, which we used to see quite a lot in the 1990s because of the limitations of the technology. 
However, there's a new generation of patients coming through. That is the Coloradans. That is patients that are older but still very active. I, it absolutely amazes me how many patients that are in their 80s that look like they're 60 years old or even younger and could probably kick my butt in any sporting activities such as biking. Um, and then also, patients are younger. They're much more active. They're doing things that put their knees in jeopardy or hips in jeopardy, such as the gentleman that had post-traumatic arthritis. So the indications for a total in hip and knee has really expanded. In addition, the expectations are much higher. Again, these were originally designed for patients that were more sedentary, but now more and more patients are coming in with much more demand. They want to hike 14ers. They want to go skiing. And so the technology has really, really increased over the past 15 years that could provide the pain relief for these patients to continue on with their lifestyle. Now, the problem with longevity is still there, but it has substantially gotten uh, improved. And this is through newer technology, such as 3D, implant, uh, 3D printed implants and improved manufacturing processes of the implants. So here is a picture of some really new technology. It's only a, probably about five years old. Uh, this is a striker implant, which is what I use. You can see that uh, this has a little gritty area on the uh, bottom of this where the bone literally grows into the implant, increasing the longevity so that we don't get that loosening that we saw of the implants on the previous slide. So how can I avoid or delay a joint replacement? So there's many, many options that we have. Uh, and we're gonna go over each one of these uh, as a um, slightly detailed um, uh, treatment option, which may be uh, something that you are looking forward uh, to doing, or maybe that's uh, you've already tried it, and what is the next step? So we begin with a non-operative treatment, the very simple things that you can do at home. So rice and insects. So rice is not like the rice food to, or gluten-free diet yet, uh, but it's more of rest, ice, compression, and elevation. So that's the number one thing that you would do immediately after you injure your knee or it starts to hurt. Um, Tylenol is another one that can be um, uh, bought over the over the counter. Uh, there's arthritis strength Tylenol. I have not really seen that to be very effective with um, uh, most of my patients, probably because by the time they come to me, uh, the Tylenol is no longer working. Uh, but Tylenol is an excellent option for older patients that may not be able to tolerate NSAIDs or non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatories, which are listed below. So things like ibuprofen, Motrin, Advil, Aleve, or prescriptions, Celebrex, Diclofenac, Meloxicam, those are anti-inflammatories. That may be an option for you, and these are excellent um, uh, medications that you can take to help with your pain, especially when you're active. Just make sure that you're staying hydrated uh, when you take these, because these can hurt your kidneys uh, if you uh, take too much of it and are not hydrated. Um, now, the alternative, and which we have an increasing um, uh, number of compounds, is topicals. And so uh, things like Voltaren cream, which is what you can buy at Walgreens or CVS, and then prescription strength, which is Pinsed, which where you basically put this onto your fingers and you apply that to the area that's hurting, and it directly delivers some of these anti-inflammatories so that you don't have to have the side effects such as the kidney problems or the stomach problems. And so these are excellent options for some patients. Now, a lot of times, especially in Colorado, we're always searching for the alternative. We're looking for supplements that may help us. Unfortunately, there's not really any supplements out there that can really improve your joint um, uh, cartilage. Uh, the big thing is glucosamine and chondroitin, um, and this is one of the very few things in orthopedics that we all agree about. So if you look at the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, uh, you'll see all this controversy of what works, what doesn't work, what's better for the patient, and it's always, we can't recommend or go against this. One thing that we definitely have strong evidence that it does not work, and it's all placebo, is gl glucosamine and chondroitin. Now, one interesting thing is, is that diet is becoming more and more prevalent as far as what we know in inflammation. So a uh, low inflammatory diets can certainly help you with your joint pain. So, you know, gluten-free diets, um, 
you know, turmeric is a very popular thing going on that's probably going to fade out in a few years, just like a lot of the other stuff. Um, there is studies that show that turmeric does lower your inflammation, but if you look at those studies, you would have to literally ingest a pound of it in order to get that effect. And I don't think that would be very pleasant. So, so if these are not working, this is when usually patients show up into our clinics because they need an escalation of care. So then this is when we make recommendations as far as lifestyle changes. Uh, so we try to tell uh, patients to avoid high impact activities such as running, jumping, or anything that requires high impact and substituting for things like biking, swimming, where it doesn't hurt the joint. Now, the problem is, is that there's a lot of patients uh, in uh, Colorado that love to run, so this may not be suitable uh, to what your goals are. Um, so uh, that sometimes is hard to tell patients uh, to not to do. Uh, but one thing that is really important, which tends not to be a big deal here uh, in Colorado, but was a huge deal where I trained in uh, Tennessee, Nebraska, in Kentucky is weight loss. So the goal is to have a BMI that is a, ba um, a body mass uh, index of less than 40. Um, but uh, if you take a look at this right here, if you lose 20 pounds, your joints on your knees and hips see 100 to 180 pounds less force through those joints. So if you can imagine, if you're just slightly overweight, if you lose just even 10 pounds, that's a significant amount of weight that's uh, being lost through those joints and can certainly make them feel better. Now, as we escalate the care, we go more invasive. So things such as joint injections. Uh, now we have several different types of injections that we can place into the joints and we're gonna go into a little bit of details and talk about the pros and cons. So the first one is cortisone. That's usually the first line of treatment. Uh, the reason why is that they're effective, usually in the short term. Uh, but these can actually last some patients uh, for a couple of years. Uh, sometimes it lasts only a few days if they have severe arthritis. But what it comes down to as far as the effectiveness of these injections is, is how much cartilage you have left. Uh, but the purpose of the cortisone is to decrease the inflammation. It's not doing anything to prevent progression at all. Um, but basically the arthritis is causing inflammation and this is basically knocking that pathway out to give you that pain relief. Uh, the pros to this is that it's cheap and that it's one injection. And you can do these every three to four months depending on what your doctor says. Uh, now, the negatives to the cortisone is that it can be toxic to the cartilage. So if you have multiple joint injections with cortisone over a period of time, it can actually accelerate the arthritis that you have. Uh, now, the thing is, is most patients come in and say, oh, I don't want to have this injection because I don't want to ruin my knees. The purpose of this cortisone is to get you to the point in your life where it's convenient for you to have escalated care. Because once you have, start to have uh, end stage arthritis, it's all about planning. Because it is a big deal to have a, a hip and knee replacement. And maybe it's not the right time in your life. Maybe a daughter is getting married and you have to uh, be at your tip top shape and then you can have your hip or knee replacement. Or maybe you wanna get through ski season. This would be an excellent option for you. Other types of injections, so visco supplementation. This is uh, colloquially known as rooster comb or chicken shots. Uh, basically, this is made out of hyaluronic acid, which is what your cartilage is basically made out of. Now, most of the um, visco supplementations nowadays are synthetic. These are made in the labs because we can actually engineer these to last longer inside the, uh, inside the joint. And also that it can provide even better pain relief as we start to understand how these work. What it basically is doing is trying to mimic the cartilage. It's not building it, it's not replacing it. It's basically filling those voids that where you have those pieces of cartilage missing. Um, they really only work when you have some cartilage left though. Uh, so if you have bone on bone arthritis where the bones are touching together and grinding away, this is not gonna work for you. So I try to be as judicious as possible about using these because they can be expensive. So, but the pros to this is that they can last longer. They typically last about six months inside the knee. So if they work, they typically last longer than say a cortisone. 
Um, it does not damage the cartilage either. Uh, but the problem with this is, again, they're expensive. And a lot of these injections, you have to have three or more injections over a couple of weeks in order for this to have full effect. So this may or may not be an option. Second off, there's a couple of insurance companies that may not pay for these. So that's another consideration uh, because these can be quite expensive out-of-pocket costs. Now, we get into the biologics. So orthobiologics is becoming of age um, and becoming more popular. So these um, are primarily things that are called PRP injections or stem cells, in which that's kind of the, the you know, the, the nice, oh, you know, advanced, oh, everybody thinks uh, that this is the next uh, biggest thing since sliced bread. Uh, but let's talk about what these things are. So PRP is platelet-rich plasma. Essentially what we do is we draw blood out of your arm, we send it to a little machine where we spin down your blood, and then it separates the growth factors, the healing factors that are inside of our blood. Afterwards, we inject it into the joint. So the idea behind it is that this has healing properties, right? So it has growth factors, proteins that are trying to heal something inside your knee. The problem with PRP is what are they trying to heal? Well, it's supposed to be trying to heal cartilage. But the problem is, is that the cartilage is not damaged, it is worn away. In fact, what you've seen on some of these pictures of these hips and knees, you see, you see changes in the bones. You see bone spurs, which are irreversible changes. The bone gets harder where it uh, basically is, the bone is trying to build more bone to protect it. So you have these irreversible changes to the bone that PRP cannot reverse. Um, also with PRP, it actually causes more inflammation to begin with uh, before it actually starts to do something. So what a lot of physicians actually do is they inject the PRP and then they also chase it with a cortisone injection right after to decrease the inflammation from the PRP. Now, a lot of you are probably engineers and scientists and you're like, well, that biases your results, right? How do we know which one works? We know cortisone works pretty darn well. So it's really the cortisone, not the PRP. Probably last thing is, is it's not covered by any insurances, and it can be quite expensive. Uh, this usually runs close to about $600 out of pocket. Now, PRP does have a role in ortho, uh, orthopedic ailments. Don't get me wrong. It's great for things like rotator cuffs that are partially torn or other extra articular tendon injuries. This could be a great option. But for arthritis, this is not a great option uh, that uh, works for patients. Um, so uh, basically, uh, here's an example of that picture uh, with some um, arthritis of the knee. You can see that there's significant bone changes. You see all the white areas right here where the patient's bone has so much stress and is building more bone. The PRP cannot reverse that or build anything up there. Now, stem cells uh, are the uh, thing that seems like, oh, it's got to heal everything, right? Uh, stem cells are basically these pluripotent cells that are able to turn into all these different kinds of cells. So here you have uh, kind of a diagram of showing you all the different types of stem cells as we've gained knowledge about them. Then there's different kinds that are out there. Now the thing is, is that um, when you have them injected into your joint, you have to think, well, what is it going to turn into? How does it know to turn into cartilage? What if it turns into bone? What if it turns into a meniscus? What if it turns into a ligament? It doesn't know what to do. So st injecting stem cells blindly into a knee or into a hip, the stem cells have no programming. So this is kind of like for some of you computer engineers out there or software engineers, uh, is basically giving a program into a or having a computer, but there's no program or software to run it. So what are we trying to do here? We're trying to build a skyscraper but there's no software for it. It doesn't know how to do that. So the, the problem is, is that these do not work because, again, they don't know what to turn into. Second off, how does it know where to go? It's going inside this huge joint. Where is it supposed to go? It has all these different areas where it can go instead of just going to that one specific spot. 
Um, and then finally, probably the most convincing argument is that it's extraordinarily expensive. We're talking about $5,000 is what the market price of stem cell injections. So probably the, <laughs> the most convincing argument is I would love to be paid $5,000 to inject your knee in about two minutes. That would be amazing. i would be a very, very rich man. I can't ethically do that. It does not work, um, and so I can't force myself to do that for, uh, to somebody knowing that this is not going to be a great option for you. So uh, just don't do stem cells. <laughs> so finally, we get into the escalation of care. So when all of these things uh, that you have tried, uh, the next best option is surgery. But then you're going to ask yourself, well, surgery is a big deal. When is it right for me? In my opinion, it is the right time for surgery when it's right for you. So hip and knee arthritis is not an emergency. You're not going to die from it like, say, from a heart attack. You're not gonna, it's not something that takes precedence over if you have cancer. This is when it's right for you. It doesn't matter when you have it because we have the technology to take care of it. So the things that I ask the patients before I consider surgery are multiple things. So how bad is the pain? If your pain is a four, it's not time for a hip or knee replacement. It's not worth it. But if your pain is like an eight or a nine, that's such a high debilitating pain that it's preventing you from doing things. Or maybe it's discouraging you from, from doing things, such as, well, you know, I know that if I go on this five mile hike, I'm gonna be paying for it for the next two days. Or I may not get sleep. You know, a lot of these arthritis, when they start to ache, they wake you up at night, you're getting two or three hours of sleep, and it's severely affecting you. Um, also, when it's not responding to treatment, so the treatments that we've talked about before, uh, these are not responding very well uh, anymore, and that's a very typical thing. So we see, usually see a patient about a year or two before their arthritis gets severely bad. Um, so we try these treatments, and they work really great. And sometimes we do these injections for six or seven years and get these patients through uh, you know, many years of high-level activities when it finally doesn't work anymore. Another thing that you need to consider especially is your health. You may be in your tip-top shape at this point in life, um, and that if you wait for three or four more years, what, you, you may not know what happens to you. Um, I had a gentleman that I saw the other day. Uh, he's 91 years old, uh, has horribly arthritic knees, uh, and his function has severely decreased over time. Uh, he's now using a cane. He sometimes has to use a walker because his pain is so bad. He was offered a knee replacement when he was 85 years old. Six years ago, it was already bad enough that he needed a knee replacement. But he said, no, nope, I'm just going to live with it. I don't want to have surgery. Well, he lives, he's lived another six years, and now he's had increasing health problems since then. And now he's no longer a candidate for surgery. So if you're in your mid-80s and you're still pretty healthy, don't think you're too old for surgery. It, things have really advanced a lot and can provide you for high quality of life years after um, the uh, hip or knee replacement. And then finally, social factors. So a lot of pa uh, patients, um, you know, they have to think about, well, who's going to take care of me? Who's my family and when can they have time off to take care of me? Uh, so those things. And so using those joint injections or other modalities for non-operative treatment can kick the can down the road to the point where you can make those arrangements with friends or family so that they can take care of you in the interim while you're uh, recovering from your uh, hip or knee replacement. So let's talk about more um, modern hip and knee replacements. So since the 1960s and 70s, technology has substantially improved, uh, which was in the heyday of when they were inventing these things. Um, but the thing is, is longevity and function um, of these implants uh, were just not there uh, and have really increased over the past few years. Uh, so what the major problems were are listed down below. So things such as 
polyethylene wear. So that is the piece of plastic that we put um, between the knee or the hip. And as you can see here in this picture, it's uh, worn away quite substantially, like the patient I showed you earlier. Uh, the other problem is mechanical loosening. So here on the picture, you can see that the cup with the black arrow right here uh, shows that the cup has now shifted and moved uh, because of loosening of those implants. Uh, also, the number one complication today, uh, or major complication, is dislocation. So that's when the hip actually pops out of the socket, which can be a very devastating and scary experience for patients. And there's a number of reasons why that may occur. And then finally, rest restoration of anatomy. So this is kind of the big topic that we're going into, uh, especially today, because this is the advancements that we've made uh, with technology, is trying to restore the native anatomy of a patient uh, so that they had the optimal function uh, after their hip or knee replacement. So we're going to talk a little bit about these details and how the advancements of this technology has improved. So let's talk about the plastic. Uh, so conventionally, uh, uh, hip replacements uh, were metal ball on plastic. Um, but the problem is, is that this led to severe problems. So here you can see this um, uh, picture on the left where the ball is uh, coming out of the socket right here. You can see where it used to be was down here. So that plastic has worn away. And then you can see changes. Look at this giant bubble that's coming out right here. That's the plastic chewing away the bone. And this can lead to catastrophic failure. And so you get early revisions uh, due to this. Um, but that was conventionally. The great thing is, is we don't even see this very often anymore with the newer technology. And so essentially, traditionally, what they try to do is they try to make the plastic thicker so you didn't have those um, uh, pieces of plastic uh, wearing away. But the problem is, is you get smaller metal balls that go inside the hip. Now, the thing is, is technology has really changed, especially how we manufacture. So here's a uh, picture right here kind of showing you the wear, weight of, uh, wear rate of each of these bearing surfaces. Uh, as you can see here, this is the conventional um, uh, plastic uh, and metal ball in which you can see there is a substantial amount of plastic particles that would be going into your joint, and that would cause the bone to get chewed away. Now, advancements occurred in which we had uh, the piece of plastic uh, manufactured a little bit better, but we have the metal ball in here still, and we get substantially less uh, plastic. Uh, a very um, common type of surgery uh, that was in the early 2000s to solve uh, this problem uh, was metal on metal hips. Uh, so that sounds great because, well, we get rid of the plastic problems, right? And we have metal, which is much more durable. Um, and this was very popular in the early and mid-2000s. Now, if you do a quick uh, Google search, um, you will see that there's many lawsuits on metal on metals, uh, which uh, we'll talk about later. Um, and then finally, we got better at manufacturing ceramics. So uh, we have ceramic on plastic, which is what I prefer to do. Um, as you can see, substantially less plastic wearing. It's about equivalent to how much wearing properties is on metal on metal. Uh, but it is inferior to the ceramic on ceramic. So we'll talk about that later. So metal on metal hip replacements, again, it was a popular uh, in the early 2000s, um, 60 times less wear, uh, wear, but there's a huge problem, early failure. And the reason why is that they get metal particles all throughout their tissues. So here's an example of what we would see in a hip that we open up. You can see all this dead tissue with metal particles that are stuck within it. The joint fluid actually looks like motor oil. Um, and this can actually lead to pseudotumors. So here's an MRI of a patient, and you can see this white, uh, white arrow showing a pseudotumor, which is basically where those metal particles are creating a uh, inflammatory response. This has led to many lawsuits and recalls of these implants. Now, there is a popular implant that is still put in um, called the Birmingham uh, Hip Resurfacing, which is a metal on metal. It actually has a really great track record because they did a great job of manufacturing this. 
but you can still have problems. Um, if it's not put in properly, uh, this can lead to these problems. Uh, currently on my surgery schedule, again, I do a lot of revisions. I have two of these uh, because uh, the metal ions are too high inside the patient's body. One of them has a metal ion concentration that is 120 times higher than what's normal. Um, another patient has a huge pseudotumor that is dissecting all the way down his thigh and into his knee that I have to open that up and take that all out. Not good, but I don't wanna discourage you from a Birmingham, uh, Birmingham hip resurfacing because it may be right for you, um, but uh, it should be approached with caution. Uh, ceramic on ceramic, right? So that was the one where we saw excellent wear properties. Um, the problem with it is multiple. So one thing is, is that especially before we had the excellent uh, um, uh, manufacturing process called isostatic hot pressing, we would get this catastrophic failure of the ceramic liner. Uh, as you can imagine, that would not feel present, pleasant. And then also, uh, it's not fun picking out all those ceramic pieces. It's like a vase that just blew up inside uh, your hip. Now, probably the, one of the most disturbing uh, problems is this. Um, so I am going to pull up a video real quick to demonstrate what may happen. Ready? So as you can tell, that would be very disturbing, not to only to you, but to everybody else. So, um, so the ceramic on ceramic may not be the best option uh, for you, uh, unless you want to uh, let everybody know you're coming around the corner. Um, also what I've seen as well, um, which I've uh, revised a couple of hips for is, Ceramic is a very hard material, and these are impacted into metal shells. Well, ceramic is harder than the metal, and so what can happen is, if that ceramic does not sit in just perfectly, it can actually cut through the metal and cause the metal problem that we saw before. So I've had to take out some people's hips uh, that that occurred. Now, let's talk about the good stuff. So there has been extremely great advances in the technology as far as manufacturing the plastic that goes inside the hips and the knees. Uh, we found out that the sterilization process was one of the culprits. Um, and basically having this um, process done under uh, an oxygen-rich environment caused accelerated wear. Uh, so now we've sterilized this in inert gases such as argon uh, to prevent this from happening. Uh, also, uh, we have um, uh, improved our um, uh, manufacturing processes uh, to get rid of the free radicals that cause oxidation of these plastics. Uh, so we have free radical quenching processes such as annealing of the plastic uh, to reduce the amount of free radicals. Uh, melting can also reduce it, but that also affects the biomechanical properties of the implant. Uh, and then also doping it with vitamin E. It's an antioxidant, so it sequesters those uh, free radicals. And then finally, probably the most important thing is the cross-linking of the branches. And so uh, by having the cross-linking of the branches, this substantially increases uh, the strength uh, and durability of uh, the plastic. So modern polyethylene uh, is almost always highly cross-linked, uh, especially inside the hip. Uh, sometimes it has the vitamin, D, uh, vitamin E, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't really matter, and it doesn't really matter to you whether it has vitamin E. Um, it's just a thing to kind of for those manufacturing um, companies to distinguish themselves. Uh, but it hasn't been really shown to show a huge difference uh, for the patients. Um, but the most important thing is that it shows exceptional wear patterns. So from the University of Nebraska, we have one of the biggest um, uh, uh, biomechanical testing facilities uh, in the United States. The other one is at the University of Tennessee uh, in Knoxville, so they work very closely. So basically, uh, they do retrieval analysis where they take people's hip joints that were taken out for other reasons, and then they're able to process it and look at it under electron microscopy, et cetera, other tests uh, for you uh, mechanical properties engineers. Um, and then a look at the older stuff, and what they see is substantial wear properties uh, for these. 
Um, what we also see is limited to no osteolysis. That is the bone chewing away from those plastic particles. We just don't see that very often anymore. Um, and therefore, it doesn't the implants don't loosen up over time as often. Uh, this also allows for us to have thinner pieces of plastic. Um, and because it has thinner pieces of plastic, we can put bigger balls inside of the hip joints. Now, the bigger the ball, the harder it is for it to dislocate. So this decreases your risk of dislocating your hip. And then... Um, Historically, we would say, oh, you know, your hip or knee would probably last you 10 to 15 years or so, um, and then we'd have to revise it. Uh, but these uh, implants, based off of their extrapolation of these uh, studies that we're doing biomechanically, should last you greater than 25 years, even if you're very active on them. Um, and it may even be more. Um, we don't really know because the technology is pretty new. Uh, so from my perspective, being a young buck, I extend my indications to the young active patients, whereas somebody that experienced these problems back in the 1990s uh, may not offer it because they saw the horrors of doing a joint replacement in a younger patient. Now, there's other advances in technology, especially with the uh, 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 computer technologies. So we have a lot of different options that we can do to both increase the longevity of, the, of these implants, but also the function as well. There's things such as computer navigation, where we take things to help line up your hip or knee uh, joint uh, better. Um, and these are improving. Uh, I've tried these uh, a few times, and uh, computer navigation is not quite there uh, as far as... Um, uh, given us good numbers uh, and reproducible numbers, uh, but it certainly has changed a lot in the past five years. Uh, but I typically don't use computer navigation uh, because there's better things such as robotics. Uh, robotics is uh, becoming more and more present in our daily life. Same thing as uh, you know, artificial intelligence. That's probably coming along the line uh, here in the next 10 years in orthopedics. Uh, and then sensor technology So um, uh, is another thing. So actually getting objective data, that way we don't have to sit there and use our subjective uh, uh, interpretation of what we're seeing. So with the objective data, and I'm sure, again, a lot of you are scientists, uh, that's something that's very appealing. Uh, my background's in engineering as well, and so, uh, you know, I like to see numbers because they make more sense to me than me looking at it and say, eh, that looks good. So, uh, loosening solutions. So that is the implants loosening over time has really changed. Uh, as far as the hip implant side, um, uh, things have really changed over the past uh, 20 years. Traditionally, uh, the femur implants uh, were cemented in as well as uh, the hip um, uh, socket. Uh, and this is still popular in uh, Europe and Australia because it's cheaper to do. Uh, but the problem is, is that the cement is like a grout. It can loosen over time. And so um, uh, early loosening is seen with these types of implants, uh, and it's highly dependent on technique. You've got to do an exceptionally good job at cementing, otherwise you're going to have early failure. Um, there's improved techniques with cementing and everything, and that may be right for you. I do cement some of my hips into place um, uh, because there's a risk of breaking the femur during the process, uh, but I try to do other things instead. Here in the United States, 90% of our femurs are fixed with cementless technology, and 100%, uh, well, I should say 99.9% .9 of hip replacements are using the press fit technology, that is the cementless technology where the bone grows into the metal. So here's the cementless uh, uh, technology. So basically the uh, bone is machined during this operation uh, to fit the prosthesis. The bone is elastic, so the bone actually expands and then contracts back onto the metal so that it has a nice grip. Um, these implants um, are, uh, most of them are now 3D printed, uh, such as the ones you see on the right, um, uh, which I use very often. Um, and so with that 3D printed technology, we're able to manufacture this such that we can make the pore sizes just like it would be inside the bone, so that the bone literally thinks it's bone. It grows into it. Uh, there's also special coatings uh, that we can put on there, such as hydroxyapatite, which is basically the calcium 
uh, that is inside of our bones uh, to augment the growth. Um, so some of these implants we see grow in within three weeks, which is absolutely phenomenal uh, um, and everything. Knee implant fixation has really changed though. This is like the newest of the new technology. Um, still currently cemented total knees are the gold standard and they are indicated for most of our patients, especially patients that are over the age of 75 years old. Uh, because the bone is, becomes weaker, we lose about 3% of our bone mass over our, uh, or every year after um, uh, we turn 32, uh, 34, I think. Uh, yeah, I think it's 32 or 34. So uh, cement list technology for the knee replacement may not be right for you. Uh, however, we try to do this for our younger patients, and younger means 70, okay? So even 70 years old is not old anymore. Uh, so we try to do the press fit technology, but the bone dictates that. Uh, the quality dictates that. Um, this was a thing back in the 1980s where they did the press fit technology, and it catastrophically failed. Uh, so that kind of lost favor for many years. Uh, but things have uh, really changed um, as far as the design goes. So now we have 3D printed technology that improves that. And so theoretically, that improves the survival ship. Uh, hip dislocation solutions, this is where we get into the nitty gritty. Uh, that's the number one complication of hip and knee replacements, uh, in which these are the most common things uh, of why you have a, hip, uh, a, a dislocation. But the malalignment, that's the issue uh, that we can prevent as surgeons. So there's been advancements in techniques. Uh, we've improved our surgical techniques by respecting the soft tissues, uh, changing how we do the surgery. Uh, we've also had advanced technologies in how we evaluate your hip and knee replacement, or sorry, your hip replacement. So things like x-ray guidance and robotic surgery. Um, also for the knees, uh, we tried to restore your anatomy. Uh, traditionally, we cut everybody's femur and tibia in the same degree, zero degrees this way, five degrees that way. But now, um, oh sorry, uh, but this is how we manually do it. And as you can see, you have all these different jigs and it um, increases the risk of human error. So what we are now shifting to is more kinematic alignment. That is restoring your native anatomy. So here is an interface that I see during surgery where I'm able to make minute adjustments to how I'm going to put your implants into place. You can see we have all this objective data with all these different numbers uh, to, show, um, uh, to show you and how we can adjust to fit your anatomy the best. So let's talk about the Mako. That's kind of the bulk of what I wanted to talk about because this is the real advantage that you get uh, when uh, you have a Boulder community uh, a surgeon. So let's talk about that. So what it is is computer navigated robotic arm assisted. So we're still doing the surgery, but the robot is giving us objective data and helping us do the surgery. So um, when we do this, we call it a makoplasty. Uh, and it requires a CAT scan for, to do both the hip and knee applications for this. So you will have to get a CAT scan uh, for this. But what that gives us is a huge advantage. Uh, we, get to op, uh, we get to get a preoperative plan so that we are coming up with your plan on how to do your surgery before we even walk into the room. So when, once we begin the surgery, it's all about ex execution and less thinking. So let's talk about the Mako total knee. So here again is the interface uh, that we see during the operation. You can see multiple numbers where we can actually make adjustments according to your anatomy. Uh, and we'll go over this later. It also gives us the sizes. So it tells us what size it is so that we optimize what size that you're gonna have uh, during the surgery and so that we can anticipate what implants to bring and optimize um, uh, the time in the operating room. So let's talk about the process. So when we go into the surgery, we basically make our exposure, and then afterwards we set these antennas. So yes, you get antennas that are hanging off of your leg. We use this little stick that you can see the surgeon using to uh, basically mark your knee. So basically that CT scan gives us a model of what your femur or tibia looks like, and then we present these dots and everything to register the bone so that it matches the CAT scan. And then we get confirmation by popping these bubbles right here so that it has a complete mapping of what your knee looks like. After that, we get dynamic balancing. So this is where the technology really comes into hand here. This is your native anatomy. You see these numbers on the side, the 18s. What we're trying to do is match these up 
to what your anatomy dictates. Sometimes we see these numbers go really high or very low. I've seen it as bad as minus five on one side and 30 on the other. And we have to get this to a balanced area so that we have the most uh, functional knee. So if you imagine if you have 15 on one side and 20 on the other, well, one side's gonna be more loose, and that can easily happen in a conventional knee because we don't have this objective data. So here it is again in flexion so that we can get those numbers as well. And then finally, it's execution. Once we do all this, it's executing the plan. So here you can see uh, the saw blade. This is what we're looking at. The green areas is us cutting the bone. Uh, we make each of our cuts to basically shave off the bone right here. We're not cutting you a new knee. We're just shaving off the cartilage, if you will. And then as you can see here, um, we have this yellow haptic feedback. So basically when we're using the saw, it, we cannot put that saw past that boundary. So if you can imagine, there's all kinds of tissues around there. You have your MCL, your LCL, your PCL that can be damaged inadvertently by a blade. And you may not uh, have that protection when you're using other robotic systems because they don't have this technology. This is a proprietary technology with the Mako. So what you end up getting is highly reproducible total joints. And you get to protect all of these ligaments so that you're not running that saw through there. So after surgery, you want, you want to have a happy knee. That is, get the inflammation and the swelling out. Um, but most patients ask, well, what is my recovery? When am I gonna leave the hospital? Or do I even have to be in the hospital? Well, in order for you to be discharged, you have to complete five things. No medical problems, which is pretty obvious. Your pain is controlled. Uh, you have to walk 100 feet. A very common question is, well, I have stairs. Well, you have to be able to go up and down stairs before you leave. And then you have to get out of a bed, off a toilet, and out of a car. Once you meet those uh, criteria, you're able to be discharged home after your surgery. And most patients are able to do that within 23 hours of their surgery. Now let's talk about the Mako anterior total hip. So direct anterior uh, approach is uh, a newer technique that is um, becoming more popular, uh, but it's basically a minimally invasive uh, technique, uh, which allows the ac uh, access to the surgeon um, to your hip without detaching muscles and tendons. Uh, traditionally, what we did was through a posterior approach. So we did it through the backside of your hip, uh, which required a longer incision um, and disturbance of a lot of muscles and tendons. Whereas the direct anterior approach is much smaller, it's about that big, um, and you do not detach these muscles or tendons. Uh, there's also precautions that come with tr uh, the traditional approach, uh, which we don't have to do because the hip is unlikely to pop out uh, through the direct anterior approach, so this decreases the risk of dislocation. So why the direct anterior? Well, it's closer to the body. Um, second, uh, uh, the anatomy allows for us to just move the muscles out of the way instead of cutting them. Uh, and then it's minimal risks to nerves, such as the big sciatic nerve in the butt. And it's truly uh, minimally invasive. And I'll show you a picture of how small the incisions are. Um, through the posterior approach, as you can see, this red line going through the butt muscle right there, Posterior approach may be for you. I do a fair amount of posterior approaches, but that's for more complex patients. Uh, but the direct anterior, as you can see, is less pain. You're not cutting through the muscle. Uh, shorter hospital stays because of less pain, quicker restoration of your function, and it's probably more economical for you. Um, now, the direct anterior approach um, uh, is... Uh, um, of an advanced technique that may not be right for you, uh, and it may not be familiar to your surgeon, so not all surgeons offer this. Um, so a lot of surgeons, especially the older surgeons, were trained under traditional techniques, and so um, it's unfamiliar te uh, territory. And there's a lot of complications that can occur from a direct anterior approach that we don't see from the traditional approach, uh, and it's usually because of surgeon experience. Um, you also have to have specialized equipment as well. So here's how it's done. You have to have specialized retractors, so it's not just anything you can find off the ch uh, shelf, so these are available to us. Uh, you gotta have good visualization because you're going through a tiny little hole, uh, but you also have to have special tables as well in order to perform the uh, surgery optimally. Um, however, there's many uh, benefits to doing this. Um, so uh, like we've talked about before, there's less risk of dislocation, less blood loss, and it uh, may allow for a more natural feeling joint and everything. Cosmetically, it's a much smaller scar, uh, and patients, again, tend to be, recover much quicker. 
Uh, so let's uh, uh, wrap it up with the um, uh, Mako robotic anterior hip. Uh, so again, it's all about execution of the plan. Again, this is a thing that the engineers and I uh, go over prior to your surgery to put your cup in the position uh, that matches your anatomy. Again, to give you the most function, but also to de decrease your risk of dislocation. So here's a picture of me in the operating room as I'm doing the registration, which is very similar to the registration uh, that you get from the total hip, uh, or sorry, total knee. You can see you have an antenna hanging off your pelvis on the other side. And then I want to show you a couple of videos of me in action. So to wrap things up. So, so here is a video of me using the robot. So you can see the robot actually moving. And what I'm looking at is on the screen, and that green area is basically the bone and cartilage that I'm taking out. But I'm minimizing how much bone I'm taking out by using the robot. Uh, and it's making me stay within a certain plane so that I don't make a mistake and ream too deep or ream too errantly and cause problems. Afterwards, a little more action shot right here. So again, I'm putting the cup in, and here's the hammering away. And the robot's holding that in so that I'm putting the cup in exactly the position that it was designed to be in based off of what the engineers and I did. And then finally, look how small this incision, I can barely fit my hand into place. Very, very tiny incision. What you're seeing there is a small, uh, the uh, femur. Um, uh, stem that's right there and my assistant is holding these retractors to expose that and then you'll see me put the little pink ball that pink ball is that ceramic and I put it on there and we just pop it right back into place and so you'll see this come over right here cleaning off the piece of uh, metal right there to put the ceramic ball we call it the pink beauty because it's pink all into place so that is essentially the Mako total hip. All right, so why use the Mako robotics? Increased level of precision. Confidence that the components are in the right position. We still take x-rays during the operation to make sure we get your leg lengths, your offset, to restore the anatomy that you naturally had before you had arthritis. Um, because the thing is, is we do that in the operating room, we don't have to make changes. We don't have to sit there and wait and see at your post-operative visit and say, oh gosh, that doesn't look right. So we get those immediate feedback. Um, and it also optimizes your surgical results. Again, we don't have to sit there and eyeball things on x-rays anymore like we did here on the left. We have 3D CD CTs where we can actually mimic your anatomy here. But, of course, surgery is not without risks. There's risk to everything in life. Uh, but rest assured, when you use the Mako, you're getting the best and most advanced technology when you uh, undergo surgery. So in summary, hip and knee pain uh, has many etiologies, uh, that is, causes. Uh, arthritis can be treated without surgery for a long time. But if surgery is indicated, hip and knee replacements are excellent options to alleviate your pain and return you to function. The technology and techniques have substantially increased over uh, the past few years, and uh, the indications have been extended to older and younger patients. And that the Mako robot provides superior advantages that no other uh, conventional technique or other technology can uh, uh, give you at this point in time. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, but thank you again for showing up tonight, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Bowman. We are a little bit limited on our time. As I walk up, I'll just ask one question and yeah. then direct our viewers to please uh, direct any questions they have uh, to the link that's provided um, and the comment in the, in the comments. Uh, but one uh, fairly common thing was before you get to uh, the point where you need surgery, possibly you need to lose weight or possibly you've already lost some of your mo mobility. So with those two things in mind, do you have some suggestions for what our um, audience can do in those two situations? Yes, so you know, one thing as far as losing um, you know, weight, it's, it is imperative because uh, weight loss can lead to earlier revisions. It makes the surgery more difficult to execute. 
um, properly. Uh, and also, there's an increased risk of wound complications and infections. So we try to make it such that your BMI is less than 40. Um, in the meantime, there's, again, those non-operative treatments that you can do to uh, delay and help you uh, get to that point where you've lost that weight. Uh, but there's other options as far as helping you to lose weight. Number one is diet. Trying to lose weight through diet is very important, in which uh, we're more than happy to um, you know, help with your uh, nutrition, uh, with a nutritionist or your primary care physician uh, to decrease uh, your weight. Uh, but there's other options, so activity modification. So swimming aerobics, joining, you know, say, the YMCA, uh, is a great place to do water aerobics because we weigh 60% less in water that's going to be uh, less weight on those joints and allow us to exercise um, those joints. Biking is also a great thing to do because it puts less joint reactive forces on those joints, and so that's a great exercise for those patients. Uh, but it is very important to lose that weight because there are significant risks uh, of complications afterwards. Thank you so much. We've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org backslash live stream. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email. Please take a minute to fill this out. Again, please visit bch.org for information on the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you for joining us and have a good night.